All right, so today we are going, thank you, Austin. Today we're going to talk about the golden question, all right? My name is Mark Bartek. I am uh, a regional director with Focus. This is my sixth year that I've been with Focus. I'm originally from Nebraska. Yeah. I live in Denver now. Uh, I work with schools in North Dakota, <laughs> Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and also Colorado. I live in Denver. I live, in, I live there. I don't know. All right, so I want to talk to you guys about evangelization because you guys have an awesome opportunity. I think what Curtis talked about last night with you guys being at the, at the tip of the spear with that awesome animation, when <laughs> that's really what we're going to talk about today, not just about who you are and what you're doing, but what it is that you desire, that I think that we desire to do when it comes to evangelization, all right? Uh, you guys know each other at all? Have you guys been in this room stuck together? It's getting a little funky in here. Yeah, okay, so we're going to skip the icebreaker then because there's no real ice. And I know if you're hot, I can't really fix anything. But Focus has been going through several generations of change. We've been evolving over the last several years trying to identify what is it that God wants us to do because there's lots and lots of different things that we could do. I mean, we could be a rosary-making organization. We could get lots of string and tie knots and send it to people to change their lives. We could make holy cards. We could do all sorts of things like that. We could... We could do lots and lots of different things, but I don't think that God has called us to do lots and lots of different things. I believe that God has called us to do the main thing. And through lots of prayer and lots of hard work, we've identified the main thing. And the statement of the main thing is the really the key to what we desire and strive to do on campus. Inviting college students into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Inspiring and equipping them for a lifetime of Christ-centered evangelization, discipleship, and friendship in which they lead others to do the same. Winning them through invitation, building them through inspiration and equipping, and then sending them for spiritual multiplication. That's the entire goal. That's the entire summation of what it is that we desire to do. And this statement is meant to help us do the things that we need to do. And today, during this session, we're going to talk about the first part, the inviting college students into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. The invitation, it's the key, right? And I think that the invitation is the biggest key. It's the biggest key. We have to keep this in mind because it's really easy for us to, uh, to miss it, to think that we got there, to be uncertain. And, I, you know, girls, you might be able to resonate with me a little bit like on this one. Have you ever been kind of asked out by a guy? <laughs> yeah, kind of, right? <laughs> How awkward is that? What just happened? Did, did he ask me out? I don't get, I don't, why was he smiling so much? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's easy for us to kind of get to evangelization. We can beat around the bush with it, but we want to get to evangelization. And I believe that the key to evangelization is a clear proclamation of the gospel and then the invitation. And we're going to go after that specific invitation today. And so we're going to define the golden question. What is the golden question? You're going to write your own golden question. And then we're going to identify some potential obstacles and come up with a few solutions to how to get to the golden question. And we're going to finish with an exercise that I hope will be as powerful for your group as it has been for the others. And it's fun for me to watch it too. So what is the golden question? I googled golden and it didn't have anything to do with evangelization. I googled question. It had nothing to do with evangelization at all. So what is the golden question? Well, in, in layman's terms, the golden question is the invitation proposed at a moment of disproportionate influence following maybe the presentation of a gospel message or maybe it's your testimony. Maybe it's just some random movement, seemingly random to us, some movement of the Holy Spirit which is actually preparing someone else's heart to make Jesus the center of their life. That's my definition of the golden question, the opportunity to ask that question. It's a hard question. It's not an easy question, but it's the question that maybe makes the biggest difference. It might be the, the time and the place when someone makes a formal commitment. Jesus was always asking invitation questions to people, right? In Matthew 4, he asked the disciples, he says to them, come follow me. And they dropped their nets and they followed him. 
He says in John 5, to the paralytic, do you want to be healed? Other translations say, do you want to be made whole? And I don't know, if you look around on your campus, do you see students that that question, do you want to be made whole? Would that resonate with them? Are they longing for fulfillment to be made whole? I think so. Jesus also says in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Or to the brothers in Matthew 20, can you drink the cup that I will drink? My favorite golden question comes from Mark chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you can, look, you can follow along. It starts in uh, chapter 10, verse 17. And Jesus says this, uh, and it says this. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. This is the moment of disproportionate influence. The moment in which it is evident and obvious that Jesus is looking on someone and loving them. And that he is working in their heart. He's moving beyond the surface. This is heart work. This is, this is deep stuff here. This is where God changes lives. In the question, come follow me. But the key is that he's looking with love. He's looking with love. We talk a lot about relational evangelization. The key to to relational evangelization is when you can look on someone with love and extend to them an invitation. That's the key to it. Because of Christ, because of what he has given us, we can actually love without having to know very much about them. And I pray that God places a burden for the hearts and lives of of your friends, of your family, that he places that burden upon you, that you long to bring them into relationship with him, understanding that that's the greatest thing that we can ever ask. What better question could we ever ask of someone than do you know Jesus Christ and do you want to? Do you want to? I see that I'm pointing the green dot on the ceiling. It's not turning my slides. The first day I was in focus, my first day at new staff training, I was a little freaked out, and Curtis got up in front of everybody, and he said, your job as a focus missionary is very simple. It really comes down to one thing. Can you bring people face to face with Jesus Christ? That's it. That's the key, to bring people face to face with Jesus Christ and see what happens. When you preach the gospel, something always happens. It might not be what you want. It might not be what you expect. But something will always happen. Something will always happen. So first things first, why... Why should this be important to us at all? Why should we be thinking about a question that's going to change hearts and lives and bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ? I know that's I'm kind of like preaching to the choir here. But in John 17, 3, it says this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one whom you have sent. This is eternal life. That's the definition of eternal life, to know God. Knowing God is the key to eternal life. And so if people don't know God, do they have eternal life? Do they have eternal life? We have a tendency, I believe, in this nation to fall back on, oh, we're a Christian nation. Lots of people go to church. But does that mean that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that they know Jesus Christ? 
I didn't. I went to church for like 18 years, nonstop. I mean, I was raised in a great Catholic family. We went to Mass every Sunday. And when I got to college, I didn't even care. I didn't even care. It wasn't that I rejected the Catholic Church. I just didn't care enough about living my faith that it mattered at all. I just asked, why should this matter to me at all? I can stay out late on Saturdays. I can party it up. And I can sleep in on Sundays. And the only reason I went to Mass at all was because I hated disappointing my mom. And I did not go to Mass very much. I hated disappointing my parents. I think that it's easy for us to recognize that there are people that are dead to sin and do not know God, and they're still in the pews. It's easy for us to assume that because people are doing the right things, that they know Jesus Christ. That's a dangerous assumption. If this is eternal life, that they may know him, and they don't know him, what's the difference between that And the whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. That's one. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loved us enough that he came to us so that we could come to him. He's seeking for us. He's seeking for people. He's seeking for your friends, for your family. And he needs someone to help him seek them, which is where you come in. And then in Philippians 2.9, I think that one of the primary things that we miss in evangelization is that we don't recognize the power of the name of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2.9, Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth And under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Father Gabriel Amorth, who is Rome's leading exorcist, who had performed more than 10,000 exorcisms, says that there's a moment in the rite of exorcism when the person is fully possessed, when they have relinquished their faculties to the evil one, and they are acting fully under the control of the demon. That in the rite of exorcism, The priest says, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And everyone in the room kneels. They genuflect. And the demon has no choice but to genuflect. He has no choice but to genuflect. And so the possessed person will genuflect. That's the power at the name of Jesus. That even a demon who has rejected him wholly still bows at the name of Jesus Christ. My friends, I don't think we use the name of Jesus with enough reverence and enough awe and enough power. And the world uses the name of Jesus more than we do. So much more than we do. We have to reclaim the name of Jesus. And I believe that when you begin to use his name, to refer to him in conversation, people's hearts will be moved. A demon is moved by it. Why would someone's heart not be moved? This is the key. Use the name of Jesus and you will see lives change. This is a great quote from Archbishop Timothy Dolan. We are all about a person. We are all about a relationship of faith and hope and love with a person who happens to be the greatest person who ever lived, who also happens to be my best friend, who knows me and calls me by name, who looks me in the eyes and invites me to spend eternity with him. That person is Jesus. What an awesome quote. And then this one. Here's some light statements from Benedict XVI. Everything depends upon intimate friendship with Jesus Christ. Everything. So the most urgent priority is to help foster the growth of a personal relationship with him. This is a quote that has completely changed my life. It's completely changed the way I look at my work. It's changed the way I travel. It changed the way I work with my family. It changed the way I work with missionaries. It's changed absolutely everything. I don't think that there's anything that has not been touched 
in my life by this quote, and I'm going to read it to you over the next five slides. If Christianity, as so often and so rightly has been said, is not primarily a doctrine but a person, Jesus Christ, it follows that the proclamation of this person and of one's relationship with him is the most important thing, the beginning of all true evangelization and the very condition for making such a thing possible. To reverse this order and put the doctrines and obligations of the gospel before the discovery of Jesus would be like putting the carriages, or like putting the carriages in front of the railway engine that is supposed to pull them. He's Italian. That's how they talk, I guess. The person of Jesus opens the highway of the heart for the acceptance of everything else. Anyone who has once known the living Jesus has no further need to be go to long. We ourselves burn with desire to know his thought, his will, his word. It is not on the authority of the church that we accept Jesus, but on the, on the authority of Jesus that we accept and love the church. So the first thing the church has to do is present herself, is not present herself to the world, but present Jesus. The first thing the church has to do is not present herself to the world, but present Jesus. Insistence on the importance of a personal encounter with Jesus Christ is not a sign of subjectivism or emotionalism, but is the translation onto the spiritual and pastoral plane of a dogma central to our faith that Jesus Christ is a person. Maybe you've run into this. Maybe you've been discipling somebody or working with somebody that you just can't quite get them to move down the road. They just don't really, well, yeah, I really want to start a Bible study. And they don't do anything. And you have to go them, come on, you can do it. Maybe they don't really want to go pray. Maybe you've been working with somebody for weeks or months or years trying to convince them why contraception is wrong or why we believe that there's only one true church or why the Bible is infallible. Maybe you're trying to convince them of all of these things and the need is actually to bring them into relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe we're trying to put the doctrines and the obligations and get them convinced of those things before we introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ. We have to make sure we lead with Jesus. Now this is a quote by Father Renero Cantola Mesa. He's the preacher to the papal household, right? So when the Pope goes to Mass, this is the guy that preaches. He's the only guy that gets to preach to the church, that preaches to the popes. And he not only preaches to Benedict XVI, he preached to John Paul II. And if you look at their writings, man, they really line up. I think that this is the key. When I was at the University of Nebraska, when I came back to the church, one of the primary reasons why I came back to the church was because I liked apologetics. I thought it was like religious kung fu. It's like martial arts, you know? Like they come at you with this and you can craft and oh, you counter with that. I I, got, I really got to know apologetics, so much so that on Monday afternoons, I would sit down in the student union and people would come and debate with me. Like, that's what I did. And in all of that time that I spent debating with people about the doctrines and obligations of the church, I can only think of two people that had conversions. And I think they both loved Jesus before they ever sat down. Since I've read this quote and I've come to understand that if you lead with Jesus Christ, he opens the highway of the heart for the acceptance of everything else. Man, he does all the work. I don't have to convince people of anything. I just have to invite them to know Christ. And he brings them along. It's his job to change their heart, not mine. But it's hard for us, I think, because... Uh, maybe it's not hard for you. Maybe I'm alone in this. It's really hard for me. Because when I started thinking about God, I thought of, he's like out there. He's otherworldly. He's not real to me. 
He wasn't concrete. And it's really hard to introduce yourself to somebody who doesn't have hands. Hi. <laughs> what? How do you introduce somebody to a spirit? How do you do that? But he's not. John 3.16, he came. He came to save us. He came to give us eternal life. And so we have to make it personal. We have to think about it more personally. We have to think about it more humanly, I believe, and understand that actually the relationship with God isn't really all that different than a relationship with another person. And we have to first help people to know. We have to, we have to introduce ourselves to people. That's how you get to know somebody. Well, if you want somebody to know Jesus, you have to introduce them, right? And there are a lot of introductions that can be extremely awkward. I don't know if you've ever had one of those. Maybe in the last couple of days. Hi, what's your name? Oh, I already met you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's really easy to, uh, to do an awkward introduction. That's okay, right? Because just because the introduction is awkward doesn't mean that the relationship will never progress. Right? It's really possible that every relationship could progress. And relationships do progress. You spend more time with somebody, and eventually, maybe, maybe you could go from just being friends or being an acquaintance to moving to something deeper. That's the way it was with my wife. I was friends with her for years before we ever took interest in each other and started dating. And then there came a point where I was like, I, you know, Angie, I really like you. I think that we should just date each other. Right? All right, let's, that's awkward. Let's do that. <laughs> But she said yes, and it worked. And eventually, I was able to get down on one knee, and I asked her to marry me. Take a deeper step into that relationship. And then eventually, there's the opportunity to make the deepest commitment in human relationships. To love you and honor you all the days of my life. We, God wants us all to make deeper commitments. And I think that this quote from The Ultimate Relationship, a uh, gospel presentation developed by CCO, Catholic Christian Outreach, um, one of our essentially sister organizations in, uh, in Canada, sums it up very well. Beginning or deepening a relationship with Jesus Christ is very much like exchanging wet marriage vows. You make a commitment to him by saying yes or I do. People need that invitation initially to get to that point. They need that. You have an opportunity to be able to bring them into that. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little meditation. We're going to talk a little bit about your golden question. Because I believe that Christ invites all of us individually. Why? Because he knows us. He knows you by name. And he wants you to to come deeper. We can all be evangelized more. We can all come closer to him. We can all make greater commitments to him. And I think that the Benedictine vow of conversion, daily conversion, is a great model for this. These are men and women who've committed themselves to a way of life, and part of their way of life is every single day to turn back to Christ, to turn their back on sin or the world or whatever it is, and to focus fully on God. And I think God invites us to this. Maybe, maybe it's that way with you when you're reading that one verse that nails you every single time. For me, it's Mark 10. And he invites you to this. And I believe that he gives you this not only for your own sake, because he wants you also to use this gift, this golden question, in order to help bring others nearer to him. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to answer the following question. So does everyone have a 3 by 5 card? Everybody have one? Anybody need one? I've got more. We need more back there. Should I get some assistance? My assistant got sick. Can you take those back there for me? Thanks. I thought you were coming up to help. Anybody else need some? That's a really bright light. Anybody else need some? More? Okay. And so I want you to think about how does Jesus invite you deeper? You personally. 
He'll use your name because he knows you. He knows you, so he'll use your name. But what, how does he invite you? What are the words that describe how he's inviting you? Is it surrender? Is it an offering? Make an offering of yourself to me. Is it, will you come deeper? Will you give up that? Whatever it is, how does Christ invite you deeper to himself? What is he asking of you? Now I want you to close your eyes. And in your mind's eye, I want you to see Jesus' face. Can you hear him say your name? What's his invitation to you? What are the words that he uses? What are the gestures that he has? How is he inviting you deeper? Okay. <sighs> Praise God. Now, on hopefully you left one side of your card blank. I should have asked you to do that. If not, I've got a few more. I want you to write your name and then a comma. And then I want you to write down the question that Jesus used to invite you into a deeper relationship. And we're going to use this later. Someone else is going gonna, is gonna to read it, okay? Now, I'm a firm believer that when it comes to evangelization, and it comes towards the desire to bring someone into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, that the evil one is going to try to stop you. I think he's going to hate your guts, and I think he's going to do everything in his power to convince you that you shouldn't really say it. Oh, they already know. You don't need to ask. Obviously, they're already committed to Jesus, right? He's going to try to put up all sorts of roadblocks and pitfalls and easy way outs, chicken exits, or whatever you want to call it. He's going to try to get in the way because do you really think that Satan wants you to ask someone to commit their life to Jesus Christ, to make Jesus Christ the center of their life, to turn their back on their sinfulness and to follow after him? I don't think so. And so he's always getting in the way. But there are other things that get in the way as well. Go back to Mark 10. And that story, it's so powerful and it's so easy for us to fall into the same trap that the rich young man fell into. Remember, this is the moment of disproportionate influence. This is the moment in which Jesus is looking on him and love him. Now, God always loves, right? But when Jesus looks in a special way, like in Mark 10, I think that he's opening the highway of the heart. He's preparing someone for something different. It's not like every day. It's a deeper invitation to come follow me. He lays out the commandments for him. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. All these I've done. And he says, you lack one thing. Go sell what you have. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Come follow me. Does anyone remember what the rich young man said? What did the rich young man say? He walked away sad for he had many things. He walked away sad for he had many things. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus talked to him about his possessions. Jesus was inviting him to a poverty of sorts. But what was it really about? What was Jesus' invitation really about? It was about following him. Come follow me. And he got hung up by the things of the world. And he got so hung up by it that he missed the opportunity to follow Jesus. We all can end up there. So many ways we can end up there. I see we got priests and religious here in the room. And many of them, I'm sure, have vows of poverty. I'm guessing that none of them loved poverty and then loved Jesus. 
I don't think that you lead someone to Jesus through the poverty. I think it's part of it. I think that because they love Jesus, they're willing to live poverty, and they're able to live poverty. But it's about Jesus, first and foremost. And it's the same for us and for everyone else, too. So if we can put Christ first, then we won't have to run into the problem of allowing life to get in the way of our desire to follow him and others' desire as well, okay? For he had many possessions, and it stood in the way of his knowing Christ. What else? Now, if you have ever given a gospel presentation, or I know that there are missionaries in the room, uh, and it's really easy for missionaries, I think, because we fundraise our own salaries. We get distracted sometimes. And so I, I work with a lot of missionaries who maybe struggle with their funding, and I'll talk to them. So you went on that appointment with the donor, right? Yeah, yeah, I went. And how did it go? Uh, I went okay. Well, what happened? Well, they didn't give. Well, you asked them, right? Uh, kind of. What do you mean, kind of? What do you mean, kind of? Development experts have told us, we've, we've studied this. Research shows that the number one reason why people don't give is because nobody asks. If you, can't, if you don't ask, you can't expect them to give. And it's the same with this. You can't hint around at the possibility of giving your life to Jesus. You need to be direct, I think. Because it's also easy for us to get distracted from that, to miss that that's what we're going to. You don't sit down with a gospel presentation to just give the gospel presentation. You give them a gospel presentation because you want them to know Jesus Christ and to follow him. And that's what the golden question is. It's that invitation at the end of it. Pontius Pilate ran into this. Here he is face to face with Jesus Christ. They're having a conversation And what does Jesus tell him? For this I was born. For this I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. That's how I read it. What what was Pilate's response? What is truth? But I think what Jesus really said was, for this I came into the world. For this I was born. To bear witness to the truth. The purpose is not truth. Pilate got sidetracked. We can all get sidetracked. We can be going down the road where we're hoping to maybe bring somebody to that point where we can ask them a question. They can raise the number one apologetic item that you know better than anybody else on your campus. And you're like, I can't wait to talk to you about John 6. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to wow you. (laughs) And all of a sudden, what'd you miss? The moment of disproportionate influence. Now, I believe that John 6 is really powerful, and I think that you bring somebody face-to-face with the Eucharist, and it changes their hearts. But Pilate missed it. He's off the beaten path, seeking, well, what is truth? Intellectual knowledge of it, and what Jesus wanted from him was a relationship. I think the biggest pitfall that we can run into, if you actually get to the golden question, if you get to the place where you can ask somebody to commit their life to Jesus Christ, we're afraid of silence. We're afraid of the awkwardness of that moment. And so if you've ever been there, and I've been there, when you ask somebody and you say, Gretchen, would you like to surrender your life to Jesus Christ if you don't have anything else that you need to do right now? (laughs) Or, I mean, if you want, we can go get some coffee and we can talk about stuff. Or, I mean, but, I mean, yeah, just get get back to me on that, okay? It's not easy. And I think at the moment of disproportionate influence is the perfect time to allow silence, to let the Holy Spirit just work on their heart. And you can see it. If you ask the question, you can even see it through the entire time that you have with them. You'll see what my good friend Paul Wilburn says, and the Holy Spirit is just tap dancing on their heart. And he's just working on them. And so we want to get to that place where we can ask the question and then zip the lip and just be okay with letting the silence be. 
statistically, we know that uh, like teachers, after asking a question, wait a total of like three seconds before they answer their own question because nobody else is answering, right? So we want to give people an opportunity to really think about this. And so we're going to do an exercise, which I've uh, termed the awkwardness exercise. And so I'll tell you what we're going to do, and then uh, we'll, we'll do this. So you're going to select a partner. Now, you've gotten to know everybody really well for the last couple of hours, so that's okay. So just select somebody. I want you to stand arm's length from them, right? So reach out and be able to touch their shoulder with your hand. And uh, you're going to stand face to face. And then I'm going to say, okay, close your eyes. And you're gonna, everybody's going to close their eyes. And I'm going to count to three, and then you're going to stare at each other. Yeah, and I'm, don't laugh, okay? Whatever you do, don't laugh. That's, they're going to think you're laughing at them, and it's going to be really awkward then. And it's just, it's just better if you try not to. So stifle it as best you can. Uh, and then we'll go for an unspecified amount of time, which will feel like eternity. And then we'll stop, and uh, then we'll do it again for longer. And you're going to get really used to this, okay? All right, so go ahead and stand up and find your partner. Now, reach out and touch the other person's shoulder, right? Okay. You put your hands to your side. All right. Get psyched up for it. Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. We need another partner here. Anybody missing a partner? You guys are in the same group. Okay. Raise your hand if you need a partner still. Anybody else? We got three. There you go. We got out here. You guys. A couple more. A couple more. I believe we can multiply the people. Jesus multiplied the loaves, we'll multiply the people. Okay, perfect. Everybody got a partner. Great. If not, you're not telling me now, and you don't want to be a part of this. I don't really blame you. Okay, on the count of three, you can put your arms at your sides. So you can put your arms at your sides, and uh, on the count of three, I want you to look up and stare at each other. Ready? One, two, three. All right, stop. Shake it off. Woo! Oh, man. Oh, oh, all right, all right, okay, all right, that was only an hour, okay, I know it felt that long, it was actually only eight seconds, <laughs> only eight seconds, all right, you're building up tolerance for this, it's good, it's good to have tolerance, okay, get ready, now, close your eyes again, we're going to go a little bit longer this time, all right, on the count of three, one, Two, three. All right, stop. Woo! Woo! Oh, man, that's hard to watch. Oh, I don't know how you guys do that at all. That's amazing. Now, we're going to up the ante a little bit. Okay. All right. So I had asked you to write your golden question down on the card. Okay. And so I want you to take your golden question, and I want you to hand it to your partner. Now, I've been trying to figure this out because you guys are all facing different directions and stuff, and there's no such thing as a left partner right here. I just, all right, so the partner who is taller than the other partner, <laughs> and if it's, a, if it's a match, then... Uh, just do a real quick paper, rock, scissors. Never mind. Then uh, partner one, whoever that is. Whoever's older, if taller or older. How about that? Okay. Now, you will ask, the person who is taller will ask the other person who is more vertically challenged their golden question, okay? And after you ask that, I want you to just be silent. I don't want you to respond. I don't want you to... Whatever, right? Just, just sit there and allow. Remember, this is a question that Christ gave to you through a short meditation. And maybe it's the question he's been asking you for a long time. And maybe right now we're experiencing, like in the book of Revelation, when it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who will open the door I will enter in, and I will dine with him and he with me. Maybe he desires to come into your heart into a new place that you haven't allowed that. And maybe he wants to do that right now. And so the taller person is going to ask the shorter person their golden question, all right? And we're just going to sit on it for about 30 seconds, okay? On the count of three. One, two, 
three. Okay, now, now the shoe's on the other foot. Okay, so on the count of three, please reverse the question. One, two, three. Please always remember that eternity is worth the awkwardness. Please be willing. Please be willing to take your golden question back to your campus. If every student here committed to sharing their golden question with the people on their depth chart, God will completely transform the faces of our campus. I believe that he desires to use your golden question in order to bring about an abundance of fruit on your campus. I believe he desires to use this in order to drive forward. And so I pray that he will place that burden of responsibility upon you. It's the first stage of zeal to help you to understand that others need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so let's close with the glory be. And I thank you for your time. In the, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much.